Michael Harris begins his book, Solitude, in pursuit of a singular life in a crowded world with this story. Dr. Edith Bone has decided not to cry. On this autumn afternoon in 1956, her seven years of solitary confinement have come to a sudden end. Beyond the prison gates, the Hungarian Revolution's final scattered shots are echoing down the streets of Budapest. Inside the gates, Dr. Bone emerges through the prison's front door into the courtyard's bewildering sunlight. She is 68 years old, stout and arthritic. She steps from the prison's entrance and blinks at the sky. And then she sees them waiting for her, those suited, peering men. They are all wanting to see her tears. Photographers and reporters hoist their barrel lenses and spiral notebooks by the gleaming bus that has come to take her to the British Embassy. They watch for the mark of those seven years alone. What scar does such isolation leave on the face, on the hooded eyes? The ordinary result is a descent into madness and crippling depression. But as Dr. Bone steps across the courtyard toward the iron gates, she appears perfectly sane. If anything, she now looks cheerful. The officials and journalists stare. A man from, the, from England's Daily Express scribbles in his notebook, trying his best to dramatize things. He writes that she is limping. Later, in a week or so, he'll be embarrassed to learn that she was simply given the wrong size shoes. How did Dr. Bone survive seven years and 59 days of solitary confinement, including a full six months in total darkness, without losing her sanity or her hope? The short answer is that she relied on her formidable mind and her strong sense of self. In her memoir, Seven Years Solitary, written a year after her release, she describes tearing each one of her hairs individually to achieve the short look that she preferred after they denied her a barber because women should have long hair. In the summer of 1951, she went on a language strike, refusing to speak Hungarian and opting instead for a mix of German, French, Russian, or Italian. She was fluent in all five. She recited poetry and translated it into all the different languages that she spoke. Inspired by a Tolstoy story, she took imaginary walks through all the cities she had ever visited. She counted all the words she knew in each of the five languages she spoke. She considered how many birds she could name, how many trees, how many wines, and so on. When she was finally released, she emerged from prison in her own words, a little wiser and full of hope. I don't know if I would have emerged from seven years in prison a little wiser and full of hope, even if I wasn't in solitary confinement the whole time. Yet her story points towards a depth of spiritual grounding that I hope I am working towards. And her story reminds me of the story of Jesus in the desert that we have been thinking about this Lent. At the time of his baptism, Jesus hears the voice of God declaring that he is God's beloved in whom God is well pleased. And then the Spirit of God drives him out into the wilderness alone for 40 days and 40 nights, where he wrestles with temptation. This wilderness time is just before he begins his public ministry. And I think it helps him to clarify and resist the challenges and temptations he will encounter along the way. It helps him to know what he is not called to be. That he is not called to be the warrior king that people think they want or expect. As we'll talk about in a couple of weeks, he's going to ride a donkey, not a war horse, into Jerusalem. And he's not called to be all things to all people. When the disciples want him to be taking care of them, He'll be off praying by himself on a mountainside or asleep in the bottom of the boat. And he's not going to limit his ministry to the people who are socially acceptable or easy to relate to. He'll talk with compassion to Pharisees and tax collectors, women and children, prostitutes and convicted criminals. 
And Jesus can do all these things because he knows that he is God's beloved and he knows what his particular ministry is and is not. And I believe this time alone in the desert at the beginning of his public ministry is what helps him to know and embrace himself. We live in a strange time in history when people are both in desperate need of time alone and profoundly lonely. We find ourselves disconnected both from ourselves and from one another. Our busy interactive lives mean that many of us are rarely fully alone with our own thoughts or ideas. Even when we are by ourselves, we fill the space with outside stimuli, and I don't mean bird song or the sound of the rustling wind in the trees. We play music or listen to podcasts and audiobooks on our phones and media players when we're at the gym or going for a run or driving our cars. We grab our phones or tablets as soon as we get up in the morning to see what has happened while we were asleep. We have the radio or TV on in our home much of the time. True solitude is extremely rare in most of our lives these days, even for people who live alone. Yet if we don't spend quality time alone, we can easily lose sight of our deepest selves. We can become ungrounded, lost, frantic. Fertile solitude helps us to have our own thoughts and ideas rather than repeating those of the world around us. It gives us space to know ourselves, what we think, what we feel, what we like, who we are, what God calls us to do and be. And it also helps us to enter into deeper relationships with other people. Compassion is actually fed by solitude. If we are constantly interacting with other people, then our appreciation for the relationships in our lives actually decreases. In his essay collection, What Are People For?, Wendell Berry describes the healing power of a solitary walk in the wilderness. One's inner voices become audible. One feels the attraction of one's most intimate sources. In consequence, one responds more clearly to other lives. The more coherent one becomes within oneself as a creature, the more fully one enters into communion with all creatures. We all need time alone. How much solitude we need depends to some extent on our own inner nature. Those of us who are more introverted need a larger portion of time alone in order to offer our best self to the world. Yet even the most extroverted person needs to be by themselves from time to time in order to know themselves, love themselves, and in turn be able to offer their knowledge and their love to the world. Sadly, the quest for life-sustaining solitude, which has been part of most faith traditions for many, many millennia, is not very well honored in our society today. In fact, we tend to have a negative attitude towards those who seek it out. People who want to be alone get called loners. The person who doesn't want to come to the party is labeled as socially awkward. We judge those who don't return our email, phone calls, or text messages as quickly as we think they ought to. And many of us feel guilty if we turn off our phones for a while and make ourselves unavailable. The fear of missing out can make us reluctant to claim time and space to be by ourselves. And we forget that we are missing out on something far greater when we don't make space for sacred solitude. We are missing out on connecting with our own selves and glimpsing the image of God within us. And solitude takes practice. Solitude is more than just being alone. We can be alone and completely out of touch with God and ourselves. We can be distracted or driven. We can be preoccupied with the mundane. It is possible to wash the dishes in holy solitude. It is also possible to wash the dishes compulsively without once ever allowing ourselves to touch our deeper thoughts or feelings. It's possible to go for a walk in nature and not notice the snow melting or the trees getting ready to give forth new growth. It's possible to read a book and only see the words on the page, 
without getting lost in the story or the ideas being offered. Solitude takes practice. And solitude is also often uncomfortable, at least at first. One of the things I have noted over the years when I go on retreat is that after an initial wave of relief that I don't have to talk to anyone or worry about anything except myself for the next while, there is this uncomfortable middle time when all the things I've been too busy to address catch up with me. I often find myself looking in the eye, to use last week's theme, my fears, my regrets, my mistakes, my questions, my limitations. And I do not enjoy this process. My first night on retreat is usually characterized by an amazing sleep. My second and third, and sometimes more, are often much more restless. Being alone brings me face to face with myself. And the encounter, while holy and vital to my spiritual well-being, is not always fun. In those moments, I try to remember Jesus' 40 days and nights in the wilderness, because they weren't easy either. He met up with the tempter there, and he had to confront his own inner demons. And confronting our inner demons is sacred work. It helps us to grow, and it keeps them from seeping out sideways into our lives in ways that we are not conscious about. Still, for me at least, there is almost always a moment on the second or third day of the retreat when I have to actively resist the temptation to turn my cell phone back on, or check my email, or surf the web, or scroll through Facebook to escape from my head. If all goes well, then by the end of my time away I have at least a little more clarity about my inner world, and have hopefully had some time to pray, to dream, to connect with myself and God. Sometimes I am even startled or delighted by the new ideas and insights that emerge. And other times I leave recommitted to doing some personal work that I had put aside and not realized how important it was. Often when the time comes to return home, I'm reluctant to turn that phone back on and I avoid checking social media and my email for as long as possible. But I don't get to that place where the phone could stay in the closet all week, right away. First, I have to embrace the struggle. So this week, you are invited to embrace both the gift and struggle of solitude. As Michael Harris puts it, choosing solitude is a gorgeous waste. So embrace that gorgeous race this week. Sit and sip your coffee or tea without your cell phone or tablet. Get lost in a book. Ignore the phone when it rings. Take a walk outside by yourself. Lock yourself in the bathroom with a candle, a hot bath, and a glass of wine or lemonade. Watch the snow melt out your front window. Go on an adventure in your mind. Turn your cell phone off and put it in a drawer and see how long you can ignore it. Grab a pen and your journal or a piece of paper and write whatever is in your heart. Send everyone you live with out to the movies and stay home not doing housework. Turn the radio off in the car when you are driving someplace and just be with yourself. Build your capacity for solitude, like Dr. Bone and like Jesus. Trust that being alone helps us to have a rich interior spiritual life. It's absolutely countercultural. It takes courage, but it's worth the risk. Join me in the wilderness where being alone actually helps us to be ready for genuine community. Thanks be to God for the gift of God's presence in solitude as in community.